So our two speakers, first we have Dr. Uh, Colleen Kibblehan. She has a uh, Master's of Science in Public Health and is a professor in family medicine, uh, family and community medicine here at UCSF. More importantly, she's an experienced international expert and trainer in forensic medical evaluations of torture, ill treatment, and human rights violations. She is the chair of the UCSF Health and Human Rights Initiative and a co-medical director of the Human Rights Collaborative, which provides pro bono asylum evaluations with our medical school and legal partners. She has uh, provided forensic medical evaluations and training uh, with several organizations, including the Physicians for Human Rights, and is a lead uh, medical consultant for Synergy for Justice, which is a UK-based women-led NGO, uh, which partners with lawyers and doctors for human rights. A uh, Syrian NGO focused on identifying and preventing sexual violence. She's worked in many conflict zones in the Middle East, Central America, and Sub-Saharan Africa, providing human rights training and expert evaluations to physicians. And she remains inspired to do the work of bringing more justice and goodness into the world as a tribute to her children and grandson. She's very passionate about training and education, and uh, she's currently converting the Istanbul uh, Protocol which is an international guideline for documenting human rights violations to a standard survey format uh, that collects critical data to inform justice actors, policymakers, and clinicians. And she's graciously agreed to uh, speak to us at this very early hour. And she is uh, matched uh, very uh, well by um, Sneha Desai, who's an attorney, and she's the Senior Director of Immigration at the National Center for Youth Law. Uh, Ms. Desai leads uh, the National Center for Youth Law's work on behalf of immigrant children, uh, which includes federal litigation and policy. And for over 15 years, she's been working with youth in government custody, including children in federal immigration custody and children in state welfare and juvenile justice systems. She's testified in the California leg legislature and brief members of Congress, and she's been quoted in most, uh, multiple national media outlets. She began her legal career at the Juvenile Law Center, and she's worked abroad at NGOs focused on human rights of women and children. She's a graduate of Berkeley School of Law and uh, University of Chicago for undergrad. So with that, I will uh, pass it along to Dr. Kibblehan to get us started. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I have to say, guys, that I am um, I'm emotional, actually, about how many people are on this call. Um, it's such a tribute to Dr. Vale and your team, to the DEI group. It's actually really unusual to see, for me, to see this many folks uh, getting up at 6.30 to talk about what's going on at a bigger level in our world. And um, I'm, I feel honored actually to be with, uh, with the ortho team. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start just by describing uh, a couple of the things about UCSF, but I'll, I'll go back for a second on the on the background and what got me into this incredibly unusual passion uh, compared to my academic medicine career. Um, my first day at a residency, I was in a small uh, clinic in a town in Missouri, and uh, a dad brought a kid wrapped up in a towel, and he had a broken leg, uh, four incisors knocked out, and 90% uh, burns, and he died about six days later. And I realized as a family doc in that setting, I had absolutely no skill for being, I mean, we could treat his injuries, but we had no idea what really happened. And the story was that he slipped in the bathtub trying to shower himself and that the shower head had broken actually and was flipping all around the shower, uh, spraying him with water. And so my job was to testify one day out of residency about whether that was possible or not. And I realized I had never learned anything about or about intentional injuries really, and the mechanism of action. And that just motivated me. I did about 200 autopsies after that on kids and uh, spent about 10 years doing child death review all over the country to look at and try to understand how kids die in um, suspicious circumstances and then went to Cook County and I ran all the outpatient clinics at Cook County in Chicago for the, uh, for the hospital system there and um, met folks who were doing torture evaluations. They used my uh, work in children with their work in torture and 
um, the rest is history. So you'll hear more about that here in just a second. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully everything works. Perfect. Brilliant. So just a quick um, heads up on what is actually here already at UCSF. About a year and a half ago, we created this Health and Human Rights Initiative to try to bring together folks from multiple departments who were able to identify intentional injuries, especially in people who were crossing our borders. So I can go on. So the reality, you guys know this, but you may not know that um, we're up to the highest number of refugees and asylum se uh, seekers that have ever crossed the southern border. Happened in October. Uh, so 1.2 million per year happened in uh, October. The data on climate change suggests that that is likely to be two to four million crossing the border um, over the next five years. It's hard to put that uh, into any kind of perspective from my perspective. So we're at a high rate because of climate change, because of regional violence, and because of our own immigration policies that have not been as effective as possible. You guys know these pictures? They're the recent uh, pictures from the Haiti refugees. Um, extraordinary, really. I mean, if I stand just back and look at that and take away that, that um, CBP car up there, it looks like we're in the 1700s or 1800s in the United States. Uh, so quite striking stuff. And this is really, really common. Um, this is more of the same. So this is the bridge in El Rio in which there were uh, about 14,000 at the peak, uh, women, children, and men trying to cross the border uh, from, again, chronic violence in Haiti. I assume many, many of you um, have traveled internationally and have worked in other countries and Haiti is certainly um, one of the most challenging countries I've ever worked in. So what do we know? What we know is that 1.7 million, sorry about my 1.2, 1.7 million migrants actually uh, were detained. That's just the ones detained, let alone the ones who came across the border and arrests have soared under the Biden administration significantly. So what's the new US uh, immigration policy, some of which is in flux right now. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it, but we stopped construction of the border wall since the, uh, the beginning of the Biden administration, but the remain in Mexico policy is still in place, meaning mainly um, in my experience that has really trapped uh, Asians, Southeast Asians, Middle East folks and, um, and Africans to despite their extraordinary journeys to get to the US uh, border with clear evidence of torture, uh, have to stay in Mexico until their number comes up. Um, we reversed key restrictions on gang and domestic violence, some of which have been improved since that time. And uh, we use, as many of you might've heard, Title 42, which is a CDC public health um, regulation to stop people from coming across the border saying it's, they're uh, more unsafe than we all are. So we decided that there's nothing in San Francisco, which is pretty amazing as a sanctuary city that really brings together those people who know how to do torture evaluations, including orthopedic uh, injuries and, and lots of head injuries. So we created one of the 19 medical student clinics across the country. And you can see it's kind of a desert where we are. It's uh, LA and there's a small one in uh, UCSD and then Arizona, and then it's really East Coast groups. The average caseload is only about 25 uh, asylum seekers per year. And we can see that there's a big gap on the West Coast. In many cities across the United States, there's only one, of, one or two of us who can do these evaluations. And you'll see why it's important in just a second. So at UCSF, the HHRI has four pillars, not a big surprise to any of us in academic settings. We do our clinical arm, which is these asylum evaluations. We're all pro bono. There's no cost to the folks that we see. We've developed some national and international standards in doing these forensic evaluations that make it quite easy actually for any specialty to do them. We have derm, we have neuro, and we have primary care, lots of different specialties, psych, et cetera, to do these evaluations. We have a standard form that we use on REDCap now, and it's reduced our documentation time dramatically. Uh, and improved our data capture. 
We um, have capacity for kid exams, both uh, physical and psychological evaluations in, in Oakland now, which is great. And we're looking at opening another site at San Francisco General. Right now we operate out of the Laurel Village UCSF primary care clinic uh, at nights and on the weekends. On the education training side, we've done several uh, national and international meetings that I'm really excited about, have colleagues all over the world. Uh, we got a, an amazing $100,000 gift from the HHS to do some border training for doctors so that they didn't get shocked and have significant PTSD when they went to the border. And we have an asylum elective. I don't know whether you guys know this, but there are many, many electives that the students can take every year in their first year as they come in and we created an asylum uh, elective. Now this is in our fourth year and we have a third of the class in this single elective. And the reason, as you, as you can imagine, is not only their sense of their own future, but a significant number, and many of you know them, are medical students who are, asyl are asylees or refugees themselves or their family members are. So it has great personal impact to them and they are, they are my inspiration on a daily basis. They're incredible leaders. Um, we also have a research arm. I'm just finishing now our first 100 client manuscript. We've seen about 150 clients as of this week um, and uh, in, in a little over 20 months. So it's been quite a group. We have the highest number of uh, clients to anywhere else in any student clinic in the nation. Uh, we do our forensic briefs. We work together. We have a peer review methodology where none of our none of our affidavits go to the court without one of the rest of us who have a lot of experience seeing it. So we have a lot of mentoring strategy. And then finally, we're doing advocacy with UC Hastings. So the law school and the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies, uh, we're working with them to really become, we hope, the authoritative voice of clinicians to improve this crazy policy we have in our country. And here's why I care about this. So one out of 10 of asylum seekers who cross the border win their case with no attorney at all. It's so uh, egregious that uh, even the CBP officers at the front line believe that that person ought to come over and meet criteria for asylum. And I'll tell you what those are in a second. If they have an attorney, 30% are uh, win asylum to stay in the United States. And if they have a doctor, and they do a forensic medical affidavit, 90% of them can stay. And as of this moment, in our 150 cases at UCSF, we had a 100% grant rate. So I'm super proud of our model, which has greatly impacted the San Francisco Bay Area judges, and we are at 100%. I don't know if they just see the UCSF uh, logo and approve it, but we work really hard to make high quality evaluations. So we performed the first hundred in the first year and a half. We're at hundred percent grant rate still. And we're also the students developed an IRB and a research protocol to do the first ever follow-up for one year. So it's not enough just to get asylum. What happens in mental health? We've had one suicide to date. We've had uh, one um, accident in a car uh, with a death uh, about three or four weeks ago. So it's really tough. <laughs> I don't know whether any of you can imagine, but I've lived overseas in Brussels and in Congo. And I just, I can't imagine trying to get citizenship, citizenship there. Um, and I'm white and I speak English and I'm privileged. So be able to have housing and employment resources and frankly, learn English well enough to function in this society and uh, get mental health about what's happened to you in the previous 20 years of your life is an extraordinary thing. And so who comes over from our perspective truly are survivors. So here's Suzanne Bearcott. She's my uh, partner. Many of you know Suzanne's name. She lost five of her family members to hate crimes in the United States. This is a couple of our clients and our, our amazing medical students. So this is what we see when we walk into the exam room is that many of our folks have been detained and uh, still have bracelets on their feet uh, and are monitored everywhere they go, making it incredibly hard to work and to, uh, to even go visit family. So the torture types are things you guys already know. People get punched, kicked, slapped, lashed, hit with wires and batons. So are about 80% of our 
150 cases um, have blunt trauma. So we are then looking at that blunt trauma anywhere from a week from the time they entered across the border to years. We've had people who are at seven or eight years having been here undocumented and finally have found us and are applying for asylum. They have body parts that are crushed. They've been driven over. Their fingers are broken. They, large um, devices have been rolled on their arms and legs, crushing bones underneath. They're suspended in every possible position that any human mind can imagine. So suspended from their hair, from their limbs, hanging, et cetera. We see lots of upper body uh, orthopedic injuries. Uh, burning, lots of burning with cigarettes, uh, electricity, heated objects, et cetera, asphyxiation, um, lots of folks with choking uh, during sexual violence and then penetrating injuries, um, mostly stabbing wounds, uh, wires, needles, et cetera, put into people. Our psychological torture types are many. The one that we get most worried about is mock execution. Again, I don't know whether any of us can even imagine this, but imagine a gun in our mouth or a gun at our head or a gun at our family member's head and being told we were gonna be shot and then people laughing about it. So it's an extraordinary uh, psychological trauma. Solitary confinement is a huge one when we're learning much more about in terms of the physical and the psychological impact um, forcing others, forcing people to torture others, even our family members, uh, sleep deprivation, forced nudity, and then threats and humiliation, which are um, just as damaging. So in the chat, can you just put down what this is? We're just going to do a quick forensic training here. Whoops, I'm going to go back. All right. Yeah, thanks guys. So after today, we're never gonna think of this as a button again. This, um, this in fact, and we teach this, is that any assumptions when you walk into the room and look at these injuries that again, can be weeks to years old um, are critical to be aware of. So any assumptions, any biases, just like the in the DEI training, any biases we have based on someone's look or the look of one of their injuries, is dangerous actually in this setting because people can be deported on the day of their asylum hearing. So they're either granted or appeal or they can be deported. And so being careful about what we see here is important. So we teach immediately. This in fact um, is not anything I've seen before. It's a round object. It's about uh, two by two centimeters. It's raised off the surface of the blue background. It has four central holes that are equivalent in size and the color ranges from orange to tan. Uh, so you get the picture. So now here are a couple examples. These are very fresh wounds. These are um, Af actually Afghan, Afghanistan males who um, were, um, sorry, it's hard to talk about, who were hit on the back and on the back of the legs by some blunt trauma instrument, some whipping instrument. They described that they were uh, lying down on the ground uh, after, the, after they were detained and they were hit repeatedly by what they think was a baton. And one of the most important things we teach is the Istanbul Protocol, which is, is what they're describing consistent with, so this is the level of evidence we have to decide, is this consistent with the baton beating on the back of the um, back and the legs? Is it highly consistent with? Is it typical of those beatings or is it diagnostic of? And obviously we can also say this is completely inconsistent with that injury as they described. But this is what we see six to nine months later. So this depressed, slightly depressed scar that seems to be thicker and wider on uh, over the olecranon on, uh, on the superior side and thinner on the inferior side, and then these depressed scars here. So let's just take this one for a second, and we'll look at this acute lesion, and we'll ask ourselves, and I want you to put this in the chat, to use this standard of evidence, because we're going to do a couple more together. Do you think this is consistent with the baton? hitting the back of these two journalists, highly consistent with, 
typical of, and obviously we're increasing in standard of evidence, or this is diagnostic of. Sorry about that. So in the chat, give it a chance. There's no, just give it a try. There's no right answer here. This is about experience and being able to understand what those lesions look like. Thanks, Rosie, highly consistent. Yep, yep. Consistent with absolutely the safest bet, right? Because consistent in the Istanbul protocol means anything else, hundreds of things could have caused this. Rosie, could you just go off mute and do why you chose highly consistent? Yeah, it was battling between consistent and consistent with. Yeah. And and I, I guess I, I, I was leaning towards giving them more um, credibility or benefit of the doubt of what they said happened because I didn't see any reason that it couldn't be. Aha, uh -huh. very interesting rationale. So Dr. Vale says, who knows, right? Of course we don't know. Nobody was there and the judge doesn't expect you to be there. What we're looking at here in this lesion and we'll look, I'm so sorry, my Mac is super sensitive. So in that lesion, you can see these parallel tracks, huh? And those parallel tracks are what's called a tram line ecchymosis or, or bruise, contusion. And so what we're seeing there is the knowing that when a blunt trauma hits in a, in a direction like that, uh, what occurs is some hyperemia on the periphery and a central clearing from the force of the blunt trauma. And there's good um, evidence actually about these. And so when we see tram line, that is actually highly consistent with uh, blunt trauma. And if we looked at these legs, and I'll show you some later, we're gonna see that that same pattern actually repeats itself here with these tram line like uh, bruises. So I'm, I'm actually with Rosie on this one, I would call it highly consistent, but, but Dr. Vale is exactly right as well. And that is, we will never know actually. And so we're taking the totality of what happened and making a decision about that based on our best information, what we've learned in training, et cetera. And the training for this is about six to eight hours. This is a, um, an incision actually on the abdomen of a 22 year old female from El Salvador. She was eight months pregnant and they uh, and her perpetrators not only raped her while she was pregnant, but also did an incision right across her abdomen, took the baby out, killed the baby and uh, kind of pulled this uh, wound together. Obviously you can see it's quite a keloid. I have a picture of it all the way across the uh, abdomen. It's quite impressive, literally goes from one side to the other. You can also see this funky line here, which actually um, is probably an extension of a more uh, of the cut. And on the rest of it, they just kind of tore her abdomen apart here. And I would argue in this case that this is uh, typical of or diagnostic of, there's no evidence here of a burn anywhere else on her body. This is the only um, scar she had. So you're taking into account all of these factors when you're seeing these. And all of these cases came from UCSF. This is a lady who uh, describes that she had a machete wound to her uh, right forehead. As you can see here, this depressed scar and in this case, guys, and I won't ask you to do this, but I would just describe this as consistent, right? Because there are hundreds of other things that could have caused this, not the least of which could be self-infliction actually. But if in fact she has these in multiple other body parts and she has an excellent description for it, I might roll all of those up into a final uh, conclusion that is uh, has a higher standard of evidence. But you can see just how hard this is. This, we are not ER docs anymore in this work. We're, we're forensic docs in the sense of, is it possible that this injury happened this way? Is it possible that they self-inflicted, which you'll see a lot of self-harm in folks who are here because of their psychological trauma? And then at what level of evidence is it? This is a picture that we had in Syria um, in my work there. I'll be back there in a couple of weeks. I trained Syrian physicians to create these affidavits for the International Criminal Court. And this was a guy who had, you can see all of these uh, linear uh, incisions on his belly. 
um, these are all self-harm. And he admitted to it after a while. And the doctors in Syria had never really seen this level of self-harm. He had it all down his legs, all down the front of his arms as well, on uh, bilaterally. Uh, you can see that they're that they're heavier and they're more parallel and more precise on the right side, or sorry, on the left side of his abdomen. Uh, he is right-handed, an important question to ask. The same pattern happened on his arms and on his legs. So this is diagnostic of self-harm in addition to his description of it. It was only after about four or five hours in an interview that he described that he had significant sexual assault during the whole time he was in solitary confinement. And this is uh, what he did when he got out. And, uh, again, a couple more uh, pictures from our Syria project, again, with uh, unusual whipping injuries, which are generally wider at one end than another end. And uh, we don't have time to talk more about that right now, but blunt trauma can happen in many ways. And it really ends up in a laceration, which splits the skin and causes these um, tissue bridges that go right across the uh, whipping injury. And again, I won't go on about this, but this gives you some idea. These are all cases we've seen here of uh, whipping injuries on the right. And on this one is a complete mystery to me. What he told us is that these were cigarette burns and they were about one to one and a half centimeters in uh, diameter and that they were just repeated all over that area um, for hours by multiple people. So our work is to document torture and persecution years after it happens or months at the best. So we teach doctors to use forensic science to see and hear the stories behind these scars. This is a cigarette burn from a lady that I just saw not too long ago in the last month. Uh, and she um, was an amazing, amazing historian and described in detail that while she was held down during a sexual violence event, the person who held her down just put his cigarette out on her uh, arms on multiple places. So this is what our form looks like, just to give you some idea. It's basically a history and physical. It's just a lot longer history than most of us are used to doing. This is for the Office of Immigration here. Uh, and now, thank goodness, this used to be typed out, a 10 page or so report. It's all on uh, REDCap and has been a major uh, plus. We're the only, we think we're the only place in the world who's doing this uh, in a survey um, methodology. And we think it's applicable in, um, in conflict zones where it's very difficult to type these on your uh, laptop and then be caught at the border with this kind of information. So here's our red cap version. And I'll close with the story of our first client, um, MC, who uh, was homeless and hospitalized here in the city for about seven or eight months, uh, was gravely ill with HIV. And he um, then uh, got out and got asylum uh, in a very short period of time. He was volunteering for a while as a care manager and living in an SRO downtown. And he's now, here's his keys. He, is, uh, he won the lottery in uh, the city and he is fully housed and he works in a full-time paid position over uh, the last 18 months. And now he's gotten a director position there and uh, is an extraordinary uh, client from Brazil who had uh, severe torture for political and gender reasons. And that's it. Here's our team, a diverse group of folks. And again, we have uh, doctors from about seven or eight departments doing these evaluations with us. Uh, they keep coming back because we're all working together and we all learn together. Um, so we would, uh, we would love to have any of you who might be interested in learning this skill. You can do it forever, for the rest of your life, even when you retire, and uh, can continue learning from great folks here at UCSF. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. Open for questions, or we can just move to Niha and then uh, do it at the end, however you want, Melissa. I'll just repeat quickly the uh, question that I'm asked more than anything else. And that is, how can I stay happy after this? Um, and how can I stay um, 
in good mental health. I would say that I'm inspired every time I'm with folks. The, their resilience is so great, so much greater than any of ours um, that they commonly say things like, Dr. K, don't worry about me. You know, I was created to survive. And our last guy who was just granted um, an Eritrean young kid, 21 years old, uh, parents were killed and he just got asylum and he texted me afterwards, he does DoorDash. And he texted me afterwards and said, you're not gonna believe this, I got asylum and I had heard it from his attorney. And he said, uh, I said, so what did you say when you were in the court? And he said, I turned around to the judge and said, I was born today. So that's the kind of stuff that keeps you coming back in addition to the humility of uh, not only what people can do to each other, but what we can do as doctors with a single voice, a single HMP to make a difference in the long run for those folks and their families. So pass it back to you, Melissa. <laughs> I'm speechless. So I'm gonna pass over to, <laughs> to Neha. Great Neha, thank you for being here with me. Thank you. That was a sobering and powerful presentation. And even though I spend my days and nights doing this work as well, um, it is still just incredibly humbling and um, inspiring to hear about your work. So thank you for what you do. I wish I could say that I'm shifting to a lighter, happier topic, but I will be kind of sharing with you all um, some information about the work that my team does specifically with unaccompanied minors. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I have a lot of content to cover, so I might end up having to skip through some of it in the interest of time, but I will cover as much as I can. And can you all see? Can you all see my screen? Yes. Right. All right. For center mode, though. I don't know if you want to be. Okay. Let me. Is that better? You might have to swap displays if you have two. Or you can just share part of your screen, is another option. Okay. All right, how's that? Presenter mode. But we can still see your, we can see the slide we need to, but we could also see your next slide. So we'll be able to read ahead, but, <laughs> okay. we, but we can see what we need to see. So um, it's up to you. Okay, sorry about that. I'll give you one second. I will try one more time. All right, can you all see this? But you can still see the presenter mode. You're no longer sharing. All right. There you go. All right, can you just see the screen, the first screen? Yeah, I think if you just hit the little button on the bottom right, then we'll, you'll be good. Nia, down by the slider on the bottom right, mm -hmm. the, the one to the left, the just one to the left, left. Uh -huh, just to the left of the slider. To the right. <laughs> Go to the right times two. One yes. more, stop. Okay, I'm so sorry. All right, I'm gonna get us started. Sorry about that. So um, I'm gonna skip through some of these initial slides just to let you all know, I work for the National Center for Youth Law. We are celebrating our 50th year here and we work um, on behalf of children in a number of different domains. So as you can see here, health, education, immigration, child welfare, juvenile justice, and mental health. And the work that I lead is specifically with children, immigrant children, um, and we do kind of a variety of different, we use a variety of different legal tools to advocate for immigrant children. So I'll be focusing a lot on our litigation today, 
but we also do federal policy work and a lot of stakeholder education and narrative change as well. So for purposes of today, I'm gonna to start by sharing with you all kind of who we're talking about when we say unaccompanied children. And then I'm gonna walk through the stages of migration that these children experience and spend a little time focused specifically on the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is the federal agency that has jurisdiction over unaccompanied children. Some children spend days, others spend weeks, months, and even years in the Office of Refugee Resettlement. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna end by sharing some you know, recent developments within the Office of Refugee Resettlement as there's been a significant increase in the number of unaccompanied children arriving at our borders. And um, this is gonna be a topic that focuses on emergency sites that have popped up all over the country um, and have had some pretty horrific conditions for kids. Okay, so who are we talking about here? Unaccompanied children. This is the federal definition. And it's a little bit confusing um, and it's been interpreted differently than one would think given kind of the plain language of the statute. But essentially what, who we're talking about here are children that are arriving at the border who are under 18, undocumented and have no parent or legal guardian at the time that they arrive. Um, many of them do have parents or legal guardians within the United States, but if they don't have a parent or legal guardian with them when they're arriving, they're determined to be unaccompanied children, and that puts them into a, a whole separate system, both in terms of judicial proceedings and also in terms of custody. So I'll be talking about that more. I um, mean, I'm often asked, you know, how is it that children could even come here on their own? How is it that a parent would even send their child by themselves? Well, there's multiple ways to answer that. Um, I will say that over the years of the hundreds and thousands of kids that I've met with, um, the vast majority of them are literally fleeing for their life. And many of them don't have parents and those that do have made an impossible um, choice in some circumstances that leaving is safer than staying. And this is a poem from a Somali British poet um, that I, I just love. And she said, you have to understand that no one puts their children on a boat unless the water is safer than the land. So just a little context of where we are in terms of numbers. Um, this average line that you see across here, the horizontal line, that's about in the 5,000 range, that's what we typically see month to month in terms of arrivals of children coming to the border. And you will see a very significant dip and spike here. Um, I, it would take me quite a bit of time to really delve into the explanation for all of this. The, the artificial low that you see in 2020 is the border closure that was referenced earlier um, under the pretext of a public health order <clears throat> called Title 42. And then this very significant spike you see in 2021 is the confluence of a lot of different factors. It's the same migration push factors that have led kids to flee for many, many years, but combined with kind of this artificial backlog from the border closure, plus climate change, the pandemic itself, and you know, increasing violence and instability in home country. Um, so who are we talking about in terms of kids in custody? The majority of unaccompanied children are teenagers. There are definitely babies and toddlers and young children, and of course, during family separation, there were many children that were deemed unaccompanied and placed in the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Family separation absolutely still occurs. Um, it is in a, a much smaller <clears throat> slice of the population that we see. But when children are arriving with caregivers that are not parents or legal guardians, so a child that arrives with a grandmother or an aunt may be separated and placed in the custody of Office of Refugee Resettlement. And that's typically when we see the younger kids. And in terms of countries of origin, the majority are from Central America. However, different geopolitical factors lead to different countries being represented um, year after year. So this is actually an example of the current census as of about a month ago of all the children that are represented in, as of about a month ago, there were children from all of these different countries in the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Now, again, with some of the countries listed here, we're just talking about, you know, four kids, five kids, others were talking about thousands and thousands, but I just thought it would be helpful to see 
kind of the range of children included in the um, current census. All right, so the stages of migration for unaccompanied children. <clears throat> this is an image that gives you a sense of kind of the multiple stages from the country of origin all the way into the community. And one of the things that I wanted to really stress here is while there's been so much attention put on family separation as it occurs once children arrive at our borders, family separation actually occurs at every stage of this journey. And for many kids, it occurs within the country of origin at migration um, or at the moment of crossing the border. And because of some of our, our very complex um, and restrictive immigration policies, there are a number of families that have had to make, again, impossible decisions around letting their families, cross, letting their children cross, even though they cannot. And that too is a form of family separation. So um, people often think that the, the real trauma that occurs um, is occurring at a one particular stage of the journey, whether that's when they're in detention, whether um, before they arrive, but from our experience, every single stage of the process is fraught with extraordinary complex trauma. And this box that you see here is a quote from a youth that we met with, my team met with uh, just a couple of years ago. He was 13 years old and had traveled with his 10 year old sister, I'm sorry, um, 10 year old, six year old sister and 10 year old aunt. Um, he was fleeing for his life and the life of his family members. His mother was murdered and he was told by his stepfather that he would be murdered. And so this is all happening before he even leaves. <clears throat> During migration, I and mean, I won't go through this longer list of, of um, trauma that kids can experience, but these are the words of kids that we have interviewed and they share with us of the experience of, of swimming across the river um, in order to arrive, again, fleeing for their lives. Many kids have told us that they had never been in the water before, never, never learned to swim, and, and then they're finding themselves kind of on a cardboard raft trying to make their way across the river. Um, and only to get to the point where they cross the river and then are detained by CBP and the images that I'm sure you have all seen of children in cages and under mylar blankets, that is, this is how they're greeted once they arrive, once they cross, once they make that journey um, across the border. These are two different facilities. The Donna Processing Center that you see on the bottom of the screen is a facility that I went to in March. Um, it, at the point that I arrived, it was at 735% capacity. <clears throat> There were thousands and thousands of kids lying on top of one another, and um, none of these children were able to go outside, see the sunlight. Certainly none of them had access to recreation or education or, or phone calls to their parents or showers. Um, there were very, very, very young children there. Um, we saw babies and four-year-olds and six-year-olds, and they were there for days, weeks on end. And this was at the point where, um, if you remember the graph that I showed earlier, there was a significant spike in the number of children that were arriving. At the same time, there was a decrease in the bed capacity of the Office of Refugee Resettlement in large part because of COVID related restrictions and the need to spread kids out more. Um, but the system was woefully underprepared. And so what is supposed to happen once children arrive is that they are in these types of facilities for no more than 72 hours. Frankly, one hour is too much. These are facilities that were made for single men. Um, they were never intended to serve children and certainly not for long periods of time. Um, but once they are deemed to be unaccompanied, which and that determination is made at this juncture, they're supposed to be transferred to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is an agency within Health and Human Services. And that is the agency that is supposed to provide care and custody to these children until they can be released to sponsors who are typically family members in the United States. And those do, that do not have any family members are called Category 4 children, and there's a whole separate system that is supposed to serve them. 
So one of the most important requirements of the Office of Refugee Resettlement is that they're supposed to place children in licensed facilities. So these are facilities that comply with state child welfare laws and regulations. So that just means they meet the basic minimum requirements of having adequate food and staffing and child abuse checks from the staff that work there and um, education. And during this period of time when there was such a significant influx of kids coming in, as I mentioned, there was not sufficient bed space within the Office of Refugee Resettlement. <clears throat> this is the network of the type of facilities that the Office of Refugee Resettlement has. Throughout the country, there's over 180 facilities within the network. Many of them are very, very large shelters. So they have hundreds and hundreds of kids. There's a converted Walmart at the border in Texas that has up to 600 kids at a time in it. Ideally, children are in the most home-like setting, so transitional foster care or a small home-like setting, um, but that is the minority of placements that kids that the Office of Refugee currently has. And so the majority of them typically have been in shelters, but during this period over the past several months, kids have instead been in a completely made up type of category facility called emergency intake sites. These have never existed before. Um, if you look at the red dots on here, they show you the capacity of these facilities, the largest one having capacity for 10,000 children. This is a military base at the desert in Texas, and it's one of the facilities that I visited in the spring. Um, and it was in my 15 plus years of visiting children in government custody, it was the most horrifying site visit I have ever done. Um, there were hundreds and hundreds of children in tents lying on bunk cots all day long, um, no access to outdoors, no recreation. And most of the kids that I spoke with were expressing suicidal ideation um, and felt like they were being detained and punished and they didn't know why. So these types of facilities that popped up all over were in convention centers, they were in military bases, um, a, a term I'd never heard before, they were in oil man camps in Texas, which is, which is just a, a place where typically um, oil workers live, but instead they had unaccompanied children who had just fled for their lives in, in these man camps. And this is what some of the facilities looked like. Um, our team visited all three of these facilities. The Dallas Convention Center was really striking. You walk in, it's literally the convention center. And there were, again, as you can see here, thousands of cots lined up. Um, when we went there, it was completely full. There were several thousand children there. Never got to go outside. They were on these cots basically all day, every day. And some of them were there for extremely long periods of time. So back in May, um, again, you can see here, the majority of kids were in, well, there were 48% of kids in these emergency intake sites. But when you combine that with the influx facilities, which are also unlicensed, almost half of kids in federal immigration custody were in unlicensed facilities that did not meet any, that do not meet any of the basic standards required for unaccompanied children. So our team set out to visit um, and interview children at every single emergency intake site that was created over the past few months. Um, and these are all facilities that have come up just since the spring. So there were 14 in total. And then most recently, actually just a week ago, our team visited um, Afghan children that are now at that are in place in Chicago and also in Michigan. So that's a, a, a newer population, but a pretty significant one of unaccompanied children. And just to give you a little bit of insight into kind of the experience of kids that are in these facilities, um, we have some quotes here from inter children that we interviewed directly. I'll just give you a minute to look at those. So there was a huge range of the type of facilities that popped up over the past couple of months, and some of them had absolutely no privacy, absolutely no education, absolutely no mental health, and others had a modicum of each of these. Um, but regardless, none of them met the standards set out by law, um, which requires these kids to be in licensed facilities. 
So if they had been in these facilities for you know, 72 hours, 48 hours, it would have been one thing, but our data analysis showed that many of these kids were in there for very, very prolonged periods of time. And again, imagine you know, 60 days, like never getting to go outside, never getting to speak to their families. This is another example from our data of how long some of these kids were in, <clears throat> in the facilities the emergency intake. And as you can imagine, the mental health of these children um, was really deeply compromised. And as I mentioned, um, our team met with child after child that was expressing suicidal ideation. We had to stop most of our interviews and make a referral to immediate um, crisis services and, and mental health services. And of course, these facilities, many of them were not equipped with adequate trained mental health clinicians. Um, they had volunteers that were inadequately trained and were trying to deal with these very, very high need situations. Um, so many children did get transferred to psych hospitals and ERs where um, they remained for, for weeks on end. And this was a period of time where there was um, a lot of media interest in, in what we were seeing. And so these are just some snapshots of, of um, media that our team did. And this is part of the, the narrative change work that our team tries to do where we um, you know, speak to the media and really try and, and humanize what, what is happening and what the experience is of these children since there's so much misinformation about who they are and, and what they're experiencing. And probably most importantly, from the legal perspective, um, once we saw all the things that we saw our team filed litigation, um, we have the ability through the Flores Consent Decree. Flores is a case that was filed all the way back in 1985 by our organization and another organization. And it resulted in a landmark consent decree that sets the basic standards that the government must comply with in terms of the care, custody, and release of unaccompanied children. Um, and our investigation from all of these different site visits and interviews with children revealed that the government is breaching their contractual obligation to these children. And so we have filed a motion to hold them accountable and ensure that children are in licensed facilities that meet the, the bare requirements. Um, that litigation right now is in settlement talks and we are hoping to have a settlement agreement soon that ensures these children are not in the conditions that we found them in um, ever again. So I will pause there. Um, there is a lot more I could share, but I want to make sure that we have just a couple of minutes for questions, if anybody would like to jump in. Um, Neha and Colleen, thank you so much for those amazing talks. Um, it's, uh, wow, yeah, um, hard to come up with words, but um, I guess my question to, to both of you um, is, um, you know, we are orthopedic surgeons. Um, and so we, we have a particular, you know, set of, of skills, um, and responsibilities in our, in our work. I would love to hear from both of you. I think Colleen, you, you mentioned that, you know, we could get involved with the clinic. Um, but from both of you, what can we do? Neha, you know, you, you know, we're, there's a whole group of us that are pediatric orthopedic surgeons, like, where's our role as advocates for these kids? Um, and, and what are some things that we could all get involved in? Go ahead first, Neha, on the kind of state and national advocacy, and then I'll do the local stuff. Uh, sure. So I, I think actually a lot of it goes back to what you already heard about your role as orthopedic surgeons and and contributing to asylum applications and other forms of legal relief. So the kids that, that I've spoken about, many of them do apply for asylum. Many of them have credible, valid asylum claims. Um, there are also a number of other types of forms of relief that they might apply for. So if they're victims of trafficking, if they've experienced abuse or neglect in their home country, um, there are different types of visas that they can apply for, all of which really benefit from a medical declaration. 
So even if it's not the same sort of forensic asylum eval that you heard about earlier, um, there's still a really important role for physicians to play. And then more broadly, um, in terms of you know, federal advocacy and, and state advocacy, you know, we are working on legislation at the state level and the federal level. We actually had a bill passed at the state level recently um, and we'll be introducing, we'll have a bill, a federal bill introduced soon. And that would completely reform the entire system that serves unaccompanied children. And, and at that point, it's gonna be really valuable to get the voices of doctors supporting calling legislators. We have the American Academy of Pediatrics on board with us right now. We're working with them very closely. I'll be on a call with them after this. And um, having, having you all as well as a voice advocating for this group and speaking out and supporting um, whether it is um, on the legislative front or specific policy initiatives, I think that would be incredibly powerful and helpful. So I'll pause there. Um, ditto, uh, and Colleen, first of all, thank you for asking that question. Um, I would say um, anybody who wants to learn evaluations, I put it in the chat, but uh, you can do one a month, you can do one a year. And so it's not a big lift to do the work. Um, the second thing I would say, guys, is that you know, as we proceed in our next couple of years in the country, regardless of our politics, um, we have to make a decision about whether we want people to cross the border who need safety. We have to make a fundamental decision about that. And frankly, Germany, Austria, and Canada already have. And they are radically changing their asylum processes to get folks on board with work permits, with Medi-Cal earlier and quicker. And they're filling these jobs that right now nobody is taking. And so the, the countries who figure out that immigration is forever, first of all, we've always immigrated as human beings. And we're going to immigrate more given our future with climate change. And those countries who can figure out how to do this are going to have workers who are here and safe. So a big strong push from my perspective to think hard about your own personal beliefs about this. They are our, they are our front line at UCSF. They are front line in our medical school. They are your servers at lunch and they are your maids at home. So they are us, they're our neighbors, and we need to figure out how to welcome them in a slightly less 1800s way than we've done as a country. So with that, back to you, Melissa. Bobby, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, Colleen, uh, wonderful, wonderful presentations. Uh, very eye-opening, really. Um, I'm more curious about what are we doing on a root cause level, because <laughs> clearly there are a clearly there 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 there's a huge influx of people across the border, and that's you know, basically overwhelming the systems that we have currently yeah. taking care of everybody, leading to these issues. Um, it's it's an international problem, isn't it? Because it is. we we provide safety for people, yet the countries that they're coming from are causing them to leave. So what do we do on an international level uh, to try to rectify this particular issue where people don't feel safe in the places that they actually live in, which is basically next door to us, really. And uh, we're, we think about things in the Middle East, we talk about all these other things, but we don't seem to actually look next door very carefully, or maybe we do and I just let me get rid of it. Uh, can mm -hmm. you comment on that? Yeah, Ravi, what a, what a fundamentally um, beautiful question, actually, and that is how do we have people, actually, I've never met a refugee or an asylee who wanted to be in the United States, ever. I'm sure they're out there, I just have never met them. And what they want is to be home, but they want to be safe. And so to your point about that, I think, you know, we saw our Vice President give an attempt at that. It is an endless and bottomless pit to think about why those countries aren't safe. That's probably another whole discussion around root causes. And what I would say is that, uh, you know, the first thing we can do is to get vaccines there so that people are at least safe from infectious disease. And then the second thing is to really look at what our policies are as a country that impact the lack of safety in those other countries, especially those around us. And I think that's what Germany and Austria are now really looking at is what, what have we done to worsen this 
And then what can we do to set incentives that increase the likelihood that police and governments are going to stop hurting people, including our own? I know we're at time. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you again. I think I, I think there's a lot to process and it's always powerful to understand more. These, these are also people that we see in our clinic, right? That we don't know this profound history about. And um, go, Melissa. So it's 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 very sobering to be reminded of the life outside of the hospital walls. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but know that know that there are colleagues doing some things about it in the in your institution, in our institution, and it's a, it's a really great opportunity. Well, thank you for inspiring us. Thank this morning. you all. I'm um, I'm deeply touched. Hope to work with you more. Bye, everybody. Have a great day today. Thank you.